What happens when it becomes too expensive to be alive? Now really, that's an honest question we need to start asking ourselves as a country of capitalist people. Because quite frankly, as I'm about to demonstrate, we're shackling the poor in so many ways that if things keep going the way they are, well, we're going to have a whole segment of the population that has to answer that question very quickly and very harshly. For instance, there's a newer phenomenon called the gray ceiling that is emerging in workplaces that is basically causing a huge stagnation for the newer generations. It's called the gray ceiling because it involves older employees that in previous generations would have retired already, not retiring and hanging around maybe until their 70s or 80s still working. And this ties up a lot of higher end positions because these people have worked these positions for a long time. It, it's, it's not easy to fire them for a new person that they have to retrain and do all of that. This person who might be 70 years old or whatever is still a good choice for the job, but this pretty much cuts the legs off of a lot of upward mobility that is sort of promised to a lot of the people coming up in these corporations and businesses where at one point there was this idea of working your way up but if you know the assistant manager and the manager above him and all of them have been in their job for 20 plus years well and they're not retiring anytime soon you don't really have an option to go up because unless you do something remarkable or something changes you really can't just bump these people out of their position they have pretty much everlasting seniority on you. What are you gonna do? Beyond that, when you do have a job, right, we have wage stagnation and you can't really, I don't think anyone can argue that principle, that wages have not increased much over time. It literally spells itself out on the most precursory of researches. Go Google yourself if you don't believe me. Just look, it's there everywhere. So wage stagnation by itself might not be the worst thing ever but what you do have is an ever-increasing inflation of basic costs, the costs of living, the costs of food, gas, all that shit. It all slowly increases, as you may have noticed. Things are getting more expensive. And follow the one, two, three logic here. It's very simple. If things keep going up in cost and the pay for the low poor class does not increase with it, eventually shit becomes too expensive to buy. I think that is very simple to understand and put yourselves in those shoes for a moment and it becomes a terrifying thought. You go to the store one day and you realize that for that week's worth of work you've done that you got paid for, you can afford to eat four days maybe. But wait, there are seven days in a week. Oh shit. That's where you start having the the hard choices happen. I've, I've been there in my life where you have to sit there and go, huh, so how do I cover this three day gap in food where for the house we don't have anything? How do I make food happen? <laughs> and it's sort of a stressful as fuck dance you have to do to make food happen. And yes, there are ways to do it. There are food banks and other things and go to them if you need them. They're good. And you have to do the research. You have to go there at specific times and to get government assistance. People talk about, oh, you can just go get welfare like it's no big deal. But you have to submit paperwork. You have to go through multiple application processes. You have to redo this shit every six months. And if you fuck it up at all, they'll take it from you pretty fucking quickly. Sometimes like that. Oh, your paperwork didn't get here in time. We have to refile your case now. So now you're without your food stamps for a month to three. Oh, well, sure, just a month or three, right? I need to eat every day of that. I was on food stamps because I couldn't afford that. One to three months of not the food stamps. Kind of, yeah, you get it, I'm sure. So let's talk about the next step in this, debt, right? So let's say you manage to scrape your way up a bit, right? It is very easy in this country to fall into debt. You might think you're above it. You might think you've made enough money. I got a little bit in the bank, right? I'm making it somewhere. You break your arm. Not only are you missing work, not only are you paying medical bills, you might get fired. Uh-oh, you're now fired. You might lose those benefits that you were counting to pay on the therapy or the rehabilitation surgery or whatever. You might lose a lot of things. All of a sudden, one event has just caused your life to spiral downward from lower middle class but comfortable to I don't know how I'm paying for the next day's meal, much less anything else. And 
let's do a quick talk about the mortgage system, right? Everybody's got a mortgage, sort of one of those things. It's, a, it's even a comedy punchline in 90s sitcoms, 2000 sitcoms. Oh no, we're late on the mortgage payment because of some wacky hijinks. How are we going to get the money this time? And, but it's actually a really serious issue because if you think about it, that's your house on the line. I don't think enough people, even those who have a mortgage, appreciate what that actually means. You live in this place. Everything you have is in this place, and you count on this place being there. But if you don't make X amount of dollars for enough time, they can take that place away from you. It's not really yours. It's held by a sort of economic sword of Damocles over your head, that sword being debt that says you need to pay us at least this much every month. And if you go too much in arrears on that, well, we can take your property. And every student has plenty of experience with this. Oh, yes. Don't they? Because, well, student debt is one of those things that's been rising at an incredible rate, actually. Being around, you know, I think 2014, $35,000 average for the regular college student. You know, thirty-five grand, And that's for average college student, not counting those who pursue a more advanced or sophisticated degree, who stay longer to get extra courses or do extra minors. That's not counting doctorates. That's not counting a full whole program that includes extra school after that, which can raise to hundreds of thousands of dollars, essentially, if you get like an more esoteric medical license for some high-end nuclear involving thing like you know an x-ray technician or something where you actually become certified to do a lot of shit your bills can become quite high and sure yeah your pay goes up in that field but guess what we've been encouraging people to get college educations and believe it or not people have listened not everybody but enough people have listened and gone and gotten college educations that there's a saturation and in some places an over saturation of applicants to job ratio you know there's room for only so many nuclear technicians in certain places there's only so many jobs open for different fields and if you have too many applicants well there's going to be the stories that you all I'm sure have heard of college students flipping burgers because there's no current openings at any of the places where he's applying. By the way, let's take it full circle and re-mention the gray ceiling because that applies all over the place. Not just in your Walmart, but in academia too, where you have you know scientists, you have researchers and stuff who would have retired on pensions or whatever beforehand, but now are working older, still producing papers, still being a competitive edge that they have seniority as their main advantage and you have you know new guy challenging a paper written by some 70 year old scientist who has like accolades in the field for 30 years who would have retired normally but is still working because well he's still got bills to pay can't retire well then you have well a competition that the younger people can't really win that the system originally took care of through the mechanisms of retirement that allow for mobility, that people could transition out, still have pay and enjoy their final years without working. And at the same time, younger people could have the ability to move up the ranks and get higher pay and have that mobility that's promised as part of the American goddamn dream. Because, let's take this, to, let's take this home right now, where if you can't afford to eat. Let's go back to the question I opened with, right? After demonstrating all of the points I have here, let's go back to the opening question. If you can't afford to eat, you can't afford to pay your bills, you can't afford to get the meds you need to live, how would you feel about that if basically society, the capitalistic bargain that you have struck, that should say, we take care of the bottom rung, they, you know, we're not going to promise them anything special, but they should get to eat, sleep, and do all this stuff. And, you know, they should at the very least, if they work hard, you know, get their fair shake and a place to sleep at night and food, right? Can you argue that? Can anyone argue that? Are you going to challenge me on that? Good, no, because if you do, you're an ass. If you at least try to work, you are working, you put in your fair shake, you should get something for it, right? What happens when that contract gets broken? When you work your fair shake, you put in your time, and you still can't afford the basics. You're not asking for much. You're not even really trying to own anything. You're just renting a small place just to get by with some food. And guess what? You still can't make it. You're just asking for the least possible amount to f survive, and you can't even have that. And you're working, and you're doing the thing that the, so that the social contract says you get rewarded for, and it's not enough. Why do you think people get angry and riot and loot and do bad things like that when they're that pissed off? Because they feel like the system has violated them first, that the system broke the rules, and that they put in their fair share. They tried to be a law-abiding citizen. They worked, whatever, and the system said, screw you, it's not enough. You can't do enough. 
you're just not worth enough. You know what really becomes an attractive option when you come to that realization? Fuck the system. Fuck it with a pitchfork. Set it on fire. Because it's saying that I'm simply not valuable enough to be alive. Can you imagine that? The system saying that you, just because, well, you know, your particular skill set is not as advanced or you just don't work the right kind of job and make enough money, so we don't need you. Please leave life now, basically. You can't afford to eat. Well, you know, fuck the system. I, I cannot actually be upset at the people who get mad and riot and loot when they feel like the social contract has been broken. Why? Because that's literally how society works, is this social contract. It's like, let's take the Black Lives Matter. These people have a perception that they're being targeted by the law enforcement system, the very system that is supposed to maintain peace and order and protect us from assault, is assaulting them. That is a special kind of oppressive feeling that most people can't understand when you are just a black guy walking down the street and a cop stops and asks you where you're going, what are you doing, where have you been? Just, he has no reason for this, just, and it's really because he's black and we know it. Living like that, why do you think they get mad? Why do you think you have people that give in to that rage and start rioting and looting and just attacking people because they don't feel like it matters anymore? The rules are applied selectively. Imagine if you're playing a game, right? Dodgeball. Except certain kids get to be immune to being out from being hit by the ball and you don't. Not a fair game anymore, is it? You can't equally play that game with those kids. Because they can't lose compared to you. And then let's say you got equally graded based on, oh, you got knocked out and he didn't. He gets a better grade than you. But he literally had an advantage that made it so that this competition was completely unfair. Well, we're grading you equally. But at that point, it's not a competition. Exactly. It's not. It's a rigged game. And guess what we have now in capitalism? It's not real capitalism, it's corporatism. And that's why we have it this way, because it's not about the social contract anymore. It's about every corporation out for themselves. It's not a sustainable system that takes care of the foundation of the pyramid that props up the hierarchy that it is. Exactly. Because at its core, Capitalism is a pyramid system. At its lowest rung is the largest percentage of people. And up from there, you know, to the very top. Guess what happens when the bottom rung breaks? The pyramid collapses because it's all set on that foundation. You might not like the poor if you're rich. You might think they're detestable or their own fault, but guess what? You need them. Literally, you need them for the system to work. The system that makes you rich and wealthy works because they're there. If they break, if they stop doing their menial tasks that you belittle so much, the system that makes you powerful ceases to exist, basically. Because remember, in the end, all of this is a social construct, nothing more. Capitalism, communism, whatever, it all exists as ideas that we ascribe to and thus make exist. The minute the majority of the population says, fuck the system, it's broken. It doesn't work anymore. Because that's all it is, is a cooperation amongst people. And when that trust is broken, the whole damn thing is worthless. It's probably going to end in fire.